Team and smear. Sir? Uh, team meeting. Hey, Roy, hey, Milan. Sorry, I was away for a bit. Back now. Milan, you typed some comments in. Do I need to go and read what you wrote? Or was it pretty generic? Pardon? For what? Um, you mean on the PR where I tagged you? Right. Was that a question to me? Yeah, if it was a question for Melinda. I saw that you responded to some comments I'd put in. Uh, can you ping me the link? Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Thanks. Uh, Rakesh will join in a few minutes. I didn't get a chance to update the agenda. I have a couple of PRs to talk about. Um, will I'm hoping Shiva will attend. I mean, I think we can probably get going. So we have a lot to cover uh, today, at least on the agenda. <clears throat> okay, let me have a look at the agenda as well. Steve, you want to start? Sorry, I think I'm looking at the I'm looking at the 2021 for some reason. Give me just a sec. So they want to share the screen and walk us through the who, who wants sure, to share yeah. of the agenda this week. So I'm I'm looking at the whole set. Um, can we punt project management? roadmap items to Thursday. I think I have just one item related to RC1 breaking changes and compatibility that we can discuss. Is that okay? I see items from David on migrating of the spreadsheet, triage RC1, uh, spec location, triage alpha to alpha three, new user story proposal. Can we push all of that to Thursday. Monday is primarily a tech sync. Okay, so the code, yeah, the code signing, uh, code signing cert requirement and the specs are are definitely- That the we can cover. Yeah, that the makes sense. Five. Yeah, we could, we could move the, the spreadsheet triage stuff to Thursday, that's fine. Um, okay, you, cool. thanks. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. So the let's start with the, the code signing one, if we don't mind. Can we, sure. can we jump on that one? Yeah. Because I, I mean, there, it doesn't seem like there's been a lot um, that's happened since then, but it's uh, it's important that we close out on this. So let's see, code signing. I'm trying to get get a screen open here for it. So you should see the screen here, right? 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have to get requirements. Okay. So yeah, so we have uh, we have a bit of a conflict going on here, uh, and it's I mean it, it's actually impacting a num I mean it's a number of things. So the specification right says that you have to have the the bit signed for the code signing. Um, let's see, it's it's in here. Code signing certificate must be must contain the IDP code signing um, and not any of those um, in practice. And then we also have that enforced in code as well. It's going to be a problem. Uh, and so there's there's also a bit of a discussion here uh, back from February, like, do we really need to enforce this or not? And there's a bit of a dialogue where, you know, this, the, the RFC itself, uh, <laughs> it has a challenge with us just signing any artifact. And then the, the, the requirement of course of, of notation is to be able to sign any artifact, not just code. And so this, you know, is, a, I mean, it's a big deal in terms of how people create certificates and our requirements and the like. Um, so no, no one's commented anything after all of this. I'd like to get some answers on what we're doing here. Yeah, I think Prakash can handle this one. We worked on the update for for that section, and I think we are we are in more alignment. So I think I have updated the spec already. It's just like if EKU is present, it should be code signing. If it's not present, we won't verify it. Like the presence is not must here for EKUs. Okay, so that's why I just wanted to just just to you know, summary of TLDR is if if a code signing certificate is provided, which we're not even sure it should be provided at all, that it's optional. So the majority of scenarios, I'm not, in fact, I want to tease out when a code signing cert would even be used because that's not what we're trying to achieve today, but it, it certainly should not be requiring code signing certs. So it's like if EKU is present, it needs to be code signing certificate. If it's not present, we'll accept that also. Okay. But that's, not, but that's not how it is in code, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, co uh, I updated this back, I think, two weeks back, and the, we haven't updated the code till now. I think there's a, there's a PR out to update the code. Uh, John has a PR out for that. Okay. Wh uh, which repo is uh, that? Notation code go. Let me just get, quickly get the link for that. Uh, here is the one I will ping on chat. Uh, here, uh, 12. Yeah, this is the one. This one. So, but does this actually remove? Because this looks like it's adding the CA and no. validations. Uh, it, it be removed, yeah, it will be removed as part of my change. I'll publish PR today or tomorrow. Basically, when I will be calling the signature envelope method, which we are defining in CoEgo, which should be basically performing the uh, certificate validation, I will remove every other certificate validation, validation from the code. Okay, so your code, your so this doesn't do it, but then the one that you're working yeah. on, so that this is right just, now, yeah, this just adds the code for that. I and I'm already calling the code in my method called signature envelope. I just have to plug in that method into notation go now, and remove the other signature signature certificate validation checks from the code. Okay, that's depending on my idea. Okay, does that, so, does that mean? We're not going to require code integrity, or we're going to fail if it is set. What does it matter? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? So, which way are you coding it? So, does it require CI or not CI, or do we cannot care anymore? 
Oh, can you go to the so if it's if EKU is specified, we require to be code signing certificate. If EKU is not present, we don't do any verification. No verification. So, but, so, so I also I think that's also then a point. And so you're saying if if you have any EKU, it must be code signing. Why is that a thing? Because you don't want to use a document signing certificate or an email signing certificate or a TLS certificate um, to sign code, right? Um, those certificates will then um, Sorry, sorry uh -huh. to interrupt. Let's let's go to the specific language there. If we can open the spec again. The, the question so, I have though is that the only thing you can put on notary is is an application or code. You can't put a document, in which case then a CI code signing certificate doesn't make a lot of sense. I think the only EKU that would make sense is if it's a code signing or a document signing certificate. I think those are the two ones, but we definitely don't want um, artifacts to be signed with uh, um, other uh, EKUs that are defined, right? Like a timestamping certificate should not be used to sign an artifact. Correct, but there could be another one added for secure supply chain usage uh, when those, if you don't so, know yes. one, I don't say it necessarily say it's bad, but it, there's certain so ones if we you say look, we don't want to support. So it, so it, it says if a KU is, is present for the signing certificate, must contain code signing and must not contain any KU server auth email. So it can contain code signing and software supply chain or any other custom EK, but it is explicitly saying you can't use a TLS email or timestamping related EKU if EKU is present. But the question I have. Roy, you went back on mute. I was going to say, why would you ever allow time stamping and email protection anyway, regardless whether it's a code signing certificate? We are not allowing that, right? That's what the spec You're says. Saying, we're saying must not contain. Well, I guess I'm a little confused on the language here for time stamping certificate. Oh. So it says basically if EKU is present for timestamping certificate, it must be ID KP timestamping and it must not be any extended key. It must, so basically it's an array. It can contain multiple values. So it should contain timestamping one. It should not contain uh, any EKU or email protection or server or author code signing. Because we know these are pretty standard EKUs and they should not be used for uh, timestamping. So but doesn't this imply that you can use a timestamping certificate? For timestamping? Yes. Yeah. So okay. you can, there's two types of signatures, right? Um, there's the um, the part where you're getting um, the signature of the um, of the artifact itself, and then you're also adding a timestamping signature down the road, right? And so this is calling out that if you have a timestamp, the timestamp itself must be using a timestamping certificate, and if it is a uh, code signing, it must use an EKU with code signing or have no EKU present, right? I think that's the distinction here. So we're not saying you need to have a code signing EKU. We're saying if the cert was designated for some other use case, we need to validate and ensure it's not being used for a use case that it was not designated for. So I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. Are, are we saying we want, we have a valid scenario that we want to use code signing certs? Or do we just not support them now because it's not clear why we would use a code signing cert for signing artifacts. But do we need this now? So I think we want to take a step back and see where EKUs come from, right? So when a cert is issued, you could have an EKU field in it specified or not. Uh, the EKU field extension is optional. So if there is no key usage that is defined, then we are going to go ahead and extended key usage that's not defined. 
we're going to go ahead and say this certificate is okay for use. If, however, the extended key usage has been defined, then we're going to check and see what it has been defined for. For places where we are looking at a code signature um, or an artifact signature, we're going to look to see if the EKU was set to code signing because that's the, the type of certificate we expect to be used here. If the EKU is for something else like email validation or um, TLS auth or timestamping, those are not those were validated for a very specific use case, which is not for issue, which is not for making code signatures. And so we should reject those EKUs if they're specified. Similarly, when we look at the timestamp signature, which is another one of the signatures that's going into the envelope if timestamping is done, that should look to validate that the EKU is set specifically for timestamping and not for something else, right? Um, that's validating that the, the certificate that was used for timestamping was issued for timestamping. And so it's optional in the sense that you don't need to go get a code signing certificate. You can use a certificate without the EKU, but if you do get a code signing certificate, that's valid. If you go get something like a TLS certificate, that's not something you can use to sign code. And you should not be using that to sign okay. code because that's been validated for okay. domains. So, so I, yes, you're so going down a path further. So what I'm trying to figure out is you kind of open the door and then explaining once the door's open, all the details. Well, I'm, I'm asking a more fundamental question. Do we even need to support code signing certs, period? And like if somebody provides an EKU that's set up for code signing that we reject it for now, because we don't, do we have a valid scenario that we have any that we want to support code sign certs at all? I'm not sure why we would reject it. I mean, um, this is something that someone may go and get from like a CA, right? Like it, there, it, I, the, the, the rejecting it does not, I think, offer anything at this point. It does call into question though, if okay. we're using code sign certificates to say, hey, uh, this is a trusted piece of software and run, it's allowable for execution that doesn't apply to a document or to potentially a container, right? That's why it's potentially getting us, going to get us into trouble here um, because we're not validating the con type of content we're being told to, to add or validate. Um, a code signing certificate is used broadly to generally apply to any type of code artifact, right? Um, right you can but, use it for a compiled binary for a container artifact image. And so I think right, the but, use... But, but an, an SBOM is not that. Right. Or, or another signature that we were handed in that we're doing counter signature on, right? So I'm wondering if we don't tie it to the content, whether it's going to cause us problems. Um, what up by Ian as well? I think this was. What I would argue that an S bomb is treated as code, though. Um, that's where I see code signing certificates also being used. Yeah, I think they're in the process of discussing whether they create a new EKU for secure supply chain because not everything in the SBOM is code. That's why I'm wondering whether it's going to get us into a, a world of problems. And the other thing you hear, you'd have to go off and validate that the certificate is only valid or is, is not just an encryption certificate because you can get those too. It has to be valid for signing. Like this is the thing that we were, like Ian and I were discussing, or Ian, it was a bunch of us discussing in one of these calls too, that Code signing is really meant for like elevated privileges and you know in-process kind of scenarios, and that's not something we're doing today. It's not that we might not add it in the future, but it's not something that we're trying to address today. Like yes, an SBOM should absolutely be signed, but it's not code signed. It's not lifted into a secure process like a device driver. So it's not limited to device driver or escalated privileges. All Windows. MSI installers, et cetera, are as well signed with code signing certificates. All Apple, Apple app applications are also signed with code signing certificates. So yeah, but this is for this general are... applications as well. Yeah. Hey. I think the way the, the way EKUs are validated are more based on the or, or the way EKUs are used are based more on the validation process for issuing those certificates, right? A code signing certificate is going and validating the organization that the certificate is tied to. And the difference between a document certificate and a code signing certificate is essentially that a document certificate requires a user or, or, or an individual um, as part of the approval process. Code signing does not. Um, your server auth TLS will require domain validation. 
um, timestamping requires you to validate you're meeting the RFCs for timestamping. Um, and I forget what the validation method is. So unless there is some new form of validation that we expect for SBOMs that I don't really see what would be different for that versus sort of like what we have for code signing, um, I think it's okay to go. And if we do have a new SBOM type certificate, I don't see why we couldn't add that in at a future date and saying for this reference type of an SBOM, um, you have to use a, um, um, a um, um, uh, um, you know, SBOM signing EKU. But at this point, I would say that code signing fits like the general artifact signing that we're looking for. But I, I'm arguing the slightly different. I'm saying, hey, I could argue that server auth and email protection doesn't make sense ever, right? regardless of whatever there's a time signing certificate or a code signing certificate. And whether we want to enforce that it has to have a code signing certificate EKU, I'm wondering whether we should just say, we don't care. We just say it can't have server auth and email protection. All right, so basically, so so yeah, you're saying instead of saying the must contain, just do the like remove that and say must not. Yeah, and like, you'll see that you down can... below it's the same thing, right? For time saying certificate, we say cannot have server auth email protection. I think this puts us in a gray area if an EKU is introduced um, that is not for SBOM signing and is for something else that we just don't know right. right now. Yeah, yeah, um, that's exactly right. The question here is, would this put an artificial gate and stop innovation? And that's something. I mean, I, I I would say that the adding in an EKU and correct me if I'm mistaken here, like as soon as it's out is something we could add in pretty easily, right? I, I guess the question is more backwards compatibility is what you're looking for of the notation client? I think so. I'm th wondering whether we're putting an artificial barrier we don't need to. That's all. I think the I think the I think what Niaz is pointing towards is EKUs in in the context of public CAs have specific meaning for for a CA to give you a cert for a CA to issue your certificate with a specific EKU like code signing or server auth email protection goes through a specific validation process which yeah, is but, defined for each one of them. And we think code signing makes sense. If yeah, but that doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense, Malin, because you, you get certificates all the time that you use for email protection. It isn't restricted to email. They don't even put the EKU on it. They just say, hey, it's a valid signing certificate, right? The, the email protection is a way for them to say, hey, we want to restrict it to only this functionality. Because, well, the, the, it, it's, it, it's meant to restrict functionality because of the validation that has been done on it. Right. Um, and saying that you have an email sort of like validated cert, the validation is tied to like demonstrating ownership of that email account. Right. Yeah. Um, so you can. And so what, what we're kind of getting at here is, is a question of what types of validation do we trust to say this certificate is a certificate that can be used for signing artifact images? And if you look at the validation types that are supported, um, code signing is the validations type that closely kind of matches here. I am, I am, I, I get the point that if there is a new EKU type, let's say for SBOM signing, that has a different type of validation that we also believe is valid for signing um, uh, through notary. Um, I would say that like from that EKU being sort of like, you know, um, specked out and kind of like put in and to validation actually being going out and supported by CAs, there's adequate time for us to kind of go push an update into notation and say, um, this must contain list will need have this additional um, array. Like that's a, I would say is, is, a, is a simpler add to make in notation going forward then potentially sort of like, you know, some new form of validation that we aren't thinking of that gets introduced that adds, you know, some addition that, that adds a potential way of like certificates getting misused. Yeah, except, also, uh, except also, the Microsoft position for code signing certificates is usually a much higher bar than what we're trying to use it for here. I'm just letting you know that there's pushback from them going, hey, we kind of restrict it to a specific set of functionality of, with a higher bar of assurance. That's all I'm bringing up. 
Well, that's typically can also still be done with sort of like which routes you're trusting, right? If you look at sort of like the way Microsoft uh, Authenticode does this verification today, um, if you're getting the hardware qualification, which allows you to run processes in kernel mode, that's signed with a different route um, than what's signed with sort of like a route you would get from like a public CA, right? So you can still use the root, uh, root of trust to kind of say um, what the different levels of validation look like. Yeah, I'm not sure by using could say certificates for documents though. I, I'm just letting you know okay. something's odd. I have to, yeah, step away so, from it. But so, yeah. So one, so maybe I mean I'm to take a, a a related tangent pivot here, um, and this I'd like to know because like what we're checking for right now is uh, at least where I'm getting blocked. Like when I try and specify for our flow, no EKU, right? The code's actually enforcing what is in the spec, which is that the key usage must be present and more critical and the bit positions for di digital signature. So if you're if you're requiring the bit positions for digital signature, doesn't like, is that really a normal use case? Like, I mean, like if I actually set when I, at least with the flow that I have, if I set the, the code signing cert, then it automatically sets this for me, it seems. But is it ever really a case where you would have key usage with a bit position set for digital signature and 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 doesn't that kind of lock you into doing a code signing certificate anyway? I'm, it does I'm not, I, I think, because all of the other time stamping, email protection, TLS, are also digital signature. Okay. So the digital signature is kind of the general purpose asymmetric signing, and then the EKUs are specialized use cases. I mean, if I wanted to, let's say, go to a public CA and get a just a regular cert that, or or use even a command line option where I wanted a cert that has a bit position for digital signature, is that doable or not really? It is, and I think that is what the this restriction says. Either it's okay to not have EKU. EKU is All optional, right. but if you All do right. specify EKU then we look at specific usages. Like you need to have code signing for, for the signing certificate. You need to have timestamping in the timestamp counter signature. Sajay has his hand raised up. Can we yep, to yeah, Sajay? Yep, jump to Sajay. Hey, thanks. Um, just wanted to kind of do a tiebreaker here. Um, if, if we have provision for adding an EKU, I think it's more about a timing when we need an extra EKU and go through the whole churn of re-releasing notation, right? That's the only only limitation at this point, the way I'm seeing it. So if we do manage to get uh, an SBOM or a different document EKU, we can bring this to, again, this forum. And is it okay to just add to the external key usages uh, through the proper process? Would that help? I'm asking for both Roy and, and Nias's side because um, right now the client is going to do a hard check, say, checking that this is actually, uh, and there's no provision in configuration to maybe add another key or anything like that. There is no extensibility even in the client side, right? So would it be better? What was the, the progress? I mean, what direction do, do you think would be a good way forward to kind of like bring extra EKUs going forward? I think we can define that process. That that I mean that is that is a valid ask, uh, and I like for example we the, there was an issue around uh, the document signing EKU standardizing that, and we we get the impression that standardizing new EKUs takes time. But assume we have a new EKU for the appropriate purpose which fits into Notary V two, we can extend this and add the EKU in there. It does require clients to update before they can start consuming artifacts off of that cert that uses that EKU. EKUs will also be associated with, I'm assuming what verification mechanisms or issuer uses 
for a subscriber who asks for a certificate, et cetera. So it would, it would so I, I guess the next question would be supply chain EQ, et cetera. Where, where is that being discussed? Is it in the CAP forum? Is it some other forum that 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 discussion is being headed? Okay. I think we can, I mean, if, yeah, I, I think as long as we're able to add, like to Sajid's point, able to add, it seems like we're all open to adding additional other other items here. Um, Cause I, I don't think the, let's say secure supply chain signing cert official one is coming anytime soon. If, if we can, like you said, if it must contain this and if we have a new one that's not server off email protection or time stamping, and we add that also, that's also valid, right? Um, I, I just don't know. Um, yeah. Let me try to interject a little just because I'm uh, texting with uh, Ian. He's he's in Florida, so it's, it, for him, it's what, 8.30, and he's in the backyard with his family, but he was willing to engage with typing. And I, I pasted it here. Basically, it says you, you may use code setting search, but we are we, and I think we being Microsoft in this case are not are recommending not to use search for you with code signing EKU. Um, but he also says there's needs to be some widely available alternatives. So I think this is yeah. just a little bit of where we might be pivoting heavily on how we use code signing search in Windows and how it might be used generally in the industry. Um, and his last comment probably with beer in hand, is I really want major players to agree we need a data or object signing EKU. So I guess the question without, while letting Ian enjoy his evening, what is, does AWS feel like you guys need a code signing cert for some scenario, or we're just, we're touching on this hot button of what is the plan going forward? I think we'd want to understand why the recommendation is there not to use the code signing EKU. Right. Um, what we're trying to kind of make sure happens here is that a certificate issued by a public CA for a specific, uh, based on a specific validation, um, doesn't get abused for other use cases just because the root of trust is present. So if you think about um, any public CA, if they have like a single root of trust that they're issuing code signing certs as well as timestamping certs or email certs off of, um, it's uh, one way to circumvent the validation you've done there is to go through an easier mechanism for validation and use that certificate for a different purpose. So code signing will validate the organization that issued the certificate, which is typically what we're trying to do in notation, right? Like we're trying to identify who is the entity that said that this code should be trusted or this image should be trusted or this SBOM should be trusted. You're doing entity-based validation, uh, which is what the code signing uh, EKU uh, looks for in the validation aspect. So I'd want to understand why we would recommend not doing that and why we would recommend using um, other validation forms and what the difference in validation we're looking for um, to kind of say this is not the practice we'd want to go down for because this generally has been the standard practice we've seen um, for code sending across the industry. I think the other way to look at the same thing is if so we release notation a third party vendor who a software publisher who wants to distribute publicly trusted signed containers and other artifacts, goes to a public CA and requests a certificate, what kind of certificate would they ask? And I think we are, based on this, we are saying it would be a code signing certificate. Yeah, that's why I, I, so I what, really represent what, what, what Ian's trying to, to give me here. He's, so if we, yeah, so if we, if I mean, I guess the question that maybe I would have to Ian and to the group is if, if this key usage thing is enough, like for instance, if there is a, a code, like a, a, let's say secure supply chain artifacts, signature X509 EKU added, would, would it be enough to just do the no EKU specification and do digital signature or no? Um, and, no, the, no, the, what we would want to do here is, and, and I think notation can get this change out faster than the spec gets approved and pushed out, is go in and say, must contain IDKP code signing, comma, or, 
or IDKP supply chain or whatever we, we call that. And that's the one line or, or, or that's, that's the code change that needs to happen. It's a simple code change. Um, it's adding in what are the additional valid EKUs that can be used. So can I recommend that we punt this until Ian can explain his perspective? Okay. From, I'm seeing if he can join the Thursday call. He actually thinks it's part of the cab okay. at the same time. All right. Yeah, let's, let's move on. Yeah. So just, uh, yeah, while we just move on, I will side thread this conversation to see if he can join. It sounds like he has the cab for him at 8 a.m. So he might, if it's only one hour, well, let me just close this out. He's in the pool with his kids. Like he's, you know, I asked him to join if he could rather than type, but it's easier for him to type than get on. Okay, he says he can make it work for Thursday. So why don't we just pump this whole topic to Thursday? If that works for everybody. Yes, no. Am I on mute? Yep. Nope. Yes, I think we yeah. have a lot to get through today. Yeah, we got, so let's keep going. So uh, we have the, so we just were noticing, and this is just, um, hopefully this is a quick one, um, that there were specs, there's specs, of course, in the not notary project. Uh, and then there's also a specs in the notation, you know, and, and the individual repos. So are we, what is the desired place for specs? Um, because we were also looking at uh, for, the, for the inspect spec and the verify spec. Of course, inspect hasn't been implemented at all, verify has, um, and we really could not find much for verify. And then we also noticed there's specs in two places. So what is the desired preference for where the spec lives? And are we missing something where the verify spec lives? What do you mean by the verify spec? Well, uh, if you go to notary projects here, you have one which is signature specification, um, which has some detail, de details on, on verify, but I mean, it's... Yeah, it just, just defines the signature. That's, that's, the, that's just, I'm sorry, not the signature, the, uh, it's this, this signing verification, it's just a workflow, right? This is the uh, top level workflow. Then it gets right. into the section, which is defined in the, if you go to the trust policy doc, or if you scroll down here to the verification workflow, um, it's a signature evaluation, three dot B. Maybe the link is broken. Yeah. This, this is the detail level signature verification based on a trust policy. Okay. Okay. Um, and then in terms of specifications in the, like, do we want to try and centralize all specs into the notary project or do we want to have them split between here and the notary project specs? So the split is based on some specs are kind of exclusively related to notation. And some are at the notary project level, which is more broadly, like the signature spec is a notary project one, whereas the directory structure is a notation. That, that is why the specs are in different places. And we saw um, all implementation related, Notation reference implementation related specs will go in notation CLI slash spec. So it's in the CLI repository. Okay. Um, actually, I, I want to propose to migrate uh, the spec from the notation repo to, to the notary project repo. Yeah, actually uh, by default, we use the uh, no, no, notary, yeah, you can go back to the notary project repo. Actually, we uh, put all of those requirements and uh, specs on, in that repo, but uh, people may not know the places of those CI spec in the notation CI repo. I think it, we can create uh, two folders for, you know, the spec for 
Notation CLI, and uh, Notary Project. I propose to put all of those documents in one place. In this way, people can clearly find they want. So what, uh, actually, I'm losing track of sounds. Is that Samir or is that Malin? Sorry. Um, I think Malin was kind of calling up. There, there is the difference between the notary project as a whole, which could include various language implementations and the notation CLI specific configuration, like uh, specifications. For instance, the uh, plugins are very specific to the notation experience. That wouldn't be a notary project model. So that's why we had the specs there uh, for things that are specific to notation, but like a signing format, the signature format, for instance, is irrespective of implementation. Like if you go to a, a notary project for V2, you expect to get these signature formats. So that's why the specs there. If you're trying to configure the notation CLI, there's specs specific to the notation CLI, uh, sorry, the notation binary in the notation project. But we certainly need to do this from a documentation perspective. Like if you go to notaryproject.dev and you provide links to specs and implementations, we need to clarify this in the docs, but there is a, a, a clear separation for the two. I agree on the separation, the audience for who will look at the spec, like notary project specifications could be implemented by multiple tools. They only need to look at the specifications that are currently in here. The notation specs are more of design documents related to notation because we need to have a common understanding of what, what we need to implement, like the directory structure. So those specs are more to drive consensus on what really needs get, gets implemented in notation. Okay. So do we have a plan to uh, migrate all of those spec and the requirements as well as the scenarios documents to the website? I mean, not, I mean the official website or just put it in GitHub only? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think uh we need all of the specs um on the notary website i think people would uh <laughs> if they want to go to that level of detail i think it's fine in github mm -hmm. uh, but but i think certainly some of the some of the, that information needs to be bubbled up and extracted to 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 the website um for sure dave can you just navigate to notary project that down for a second since you're up there we um we already have that set up. You know, Nate already set that up. Actually, just the actual website, not the um, the uh, GitHub repo. Just go to notaryproject.dev, like in your browser, because we wanted to make sure we weren't duplicating. Oh, so, yeah. So if you click on specifications, it does go GitHub repo. If you navigate back, I don't know if there was a new window or not. Um, but like blog or roadmap or docs, like docs are perfect. If you click on docs, while there's not much there that will actually be um, in the notaryproject.dev website. So we definitely wanna make sure we're not duplicating any efforts. So the docs will be based on a GitHub repo, but they'll be reformatted with whatever tool was used. So can you click on the docs link in the top left there? Uh, no, keep going, to, no, not those, that's historic. Oh no, sorry. So see how this has got, I forget which tool was used, but this is where there'll be Git repos for how to do these things, but it'll be formatted in this case where the specifications just take them right to the GitHub repo. We don't need to reformat specs. And this was set up by Nate from CNCF. So this was based on, you know, what he's done for various other projects. Yeah, if the spec from the repo can autom automate, you know, at least like the core commands or something um, can just be, updated and rendered here so you're not duplicating it that would be good yeah okay so i think we have more we have more to cover here um steve you have a uh
clarify recommended versus required directory structure. Steve, I think you are mute. Um, yeah, there was one I was just reading through because I was trying to catch up with all the specs on the overrides for um, per user, per system, and so forth. And there was just a, a thing in there about required versus optional. And then there were some inconsistencies, at least in the Windows category. So I was just wondering why we were doing recommended versus required, or is that what we're trying to do when we get to the security of system versus user directories. Yeah, it was the top, if you go all the way to the top, it was the first required that you clicked on. That's 505. Can you go all the way up? Uh, next one, I think it's required. Okay, hold on a second. Scroll up a little bit. Yeah, directory for, uh, no, keep going up. The documentary, wait, 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 stop right there, right above category. Recommended directory structure for those components as opposed to required. It's a nit detail, so I don't want to, we have more important things to discuss today, so. I can clarify this later, but I just, as I was going through this, I was struggling a little bit. Well, then do you have any details on this? Um, she may have heard this. He, he might have a, he might have a uh, clarification there. Yes, uh, because uh, uh, some application may load the, uh, uh, files or other things from memory or other places rather than the file systems. And uh, um, um, even if for Linux, we have different uh, distributions and they may have different folders. Uh, it's based on the system admin. Um, how do we have, if they're optional, if they're recommended versus required, then how do we manage the security and configuration? That's what I'm struggling a little bit with. Uh, so basically it depends on uh, uh, the, uh, the users are using the notation or notation go. So if they are using notation, then we are applying this uh, documentation. Uh, if the user is using notation go, then um, we don't have the control for that. Oh, I see. You're saying in random SBOM tool, if they want to use support notation signing, then they're going to use notation go. And it's really up to that CLI on where it provides it. Because that's we want to provide a way for it to define, you know, my SBOM tool. I might want to be my SBOM tool in my SBOM directory. Although I'm still struggling why if that's if it's based on notary, why wouldn't notary be in the same spot? Kind of like if multiple tools are using the Docker config, the Docker config isn't configured unique per instance. It's always in the Docker config store. So maybe this is a good discussion on whether we should be. Yeah. And the one thing is, uh, for example, for uh, for Ratify, if want Ratify want to use notation go, right? And uh, uh, what is the file structure, I mean, for Ratify? That's what I'm saying. So Ratify, when it's using notation, would actually use the notation directories. And rather than have duplicate, because then the question then becomes, if somebody's trying to configure something with Ratify and an SBOM and Notary, do they have to maintain three different trust stores? Or is it, if you're using Notary, including in Ratify or an SBOM tool, there's one place to configure it so it's not getting confusing and when confusion equals security holes. Uh, are these aliases in notation go or like environment variables that can be passed in or configuration somehow? Um, to some extent they were 
like the system. So there was a separate conversation I think that happened while you were out where we were talking about the um, security to make sure that a user couldn't override something like the trust store. So in that case, some of these are not only user configurable if the default bit was changed from system to be user. Yeah, we didn't put that in place right now. Right now, I think just user user settings take preference over the system. Mm -hmm. I have two or three more topics to cover. Um, we got ten minutes left. All right, but what? Okay, so can is there a concern with trying to have notation? code regardless whether it's used by other projects in the common location. So this way we don't wind up with duplicate and confusing configurations. That's Sorry, why can you yes, no, just trying to get closure on this one so I can do the appropriate issues PRs. Sorry, could you repeat that question? I'm just asking, is there any concern with does anybody think we need to have multiple locations that are configured separately by usage, which would lead towards config stores, sorry, trust policies and other configurations would vary based on the tool, even though you're calling a notary sign? Where, how do, how did that, I mean, I'm, I'm not following where do we see multiple locations here? This is the recommendation, right? Like, is there any indication that we are leaning towards multiple locations? Well, if it's a recommendation, then it allows for multiple locations. What I'm saying is it's not a rec it's required as opposed to a recommendation. If you're trying to get the trust stores, here is the location. It varies based on OS, and that's already captured in this doc. But you can't just choose random tool and, and put it in a different location. At the system so level, about... at the system level, the directory locations are standard. At the user level, the I I forget we use the XDG config that allows users to customize it. That's the extent of what you can do with it as per the spec. So it is locked down. For system level, the paths are cannot be changed. It is OS specific. For user level, it's up to user preference and there's defaults. That makes sense. And basically it's, it, it defers to XTG. If you really wanna change the directory for users, they use the XTG variables. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I think that clarifies it. So then you could just tweak the doc if you needed. So oh, it's yeah. requir required for system and then recommended for user. Um, I think we're good. Thank you. So this this is the first one I have on the list, Melinda. Did you uh, is that okay? Or I, I don't see any other ones you have. Um, I'll share the screen so that I can I can run through. Oh yeah. Um, let me do that. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, okay, please. and uh, I think before we get into this and we can touch upon it again on Thursday, uh, but I, I wanted to begin because last, I think last Thursday we got into a bit of debate around this. The RC1 CLI commands, and we are working on the CLI spec. We committed the baseline version. Uh, here's kind of the, uh, whatever guiding rules I'm using for it. And the same thing that we use for library. Whatever we designate as RC, release candidate, we cannot break the experience, rather that be an API or a CLI command from that point onwards till GA. We can't make breaking changes because customers, users will rely on that experience. So the same applies to CLI, which means RC1 should only contain commands which we are which we have solidified. And that is the top level command like sign and verify. And then only the options under those commands, which we, which we are going to keep the experience as is without breaking it. So which means, uh, for example, cert add, cert remove, 
any other commands where the experience is still being debated, needs to be refined, et cetera, we should not have them in a RC release. That, that's kind of my position on CLI commands. I, I want to hear if people have concerns on that. Melinda, I thought there was another one around a test scenario where we were doing a self-signed certificate that needed to be readdressed. Yeah. So, but, but the general principle is same. Yeah, we I agree. Release candidate, we won't break anything, whatever goes into a release candidate. And we can incrementally build in like RC2 comes with some new commands and some new options for existing commands that way. But we can't push out things in a RC1 and then break them in RC2. Okay, I understand that. But how did we fix the issue that we created with the, the test certificate now needing to have a tuple instead of a single self sign certificate? Did we update the text here? No, or... we didn't close on that. I think that's that's still an open discussion. I okay. didn't get to closing that. Okay. Are you um, asking to like use that as an example for what? Because I think Melinda's asking a more generic question around, do we need to yank code out that we haven't solidified? And yours is, sounds like an example of that. I think Melinda's guidance is pretty spot on what the guidance should be. The thing that came up last Thursday is we realized we created a problem with the certificate chain issue and not allowing self-signed certificates that we broke the test command. Right, we, yeah, I, yeah that, that is still an open item that we need to close. I'm, I'm basically saying out of the CLI spec, we focus on sign and verify and only on the subset of CLI command line options, which, uh, which we are sure that, that we have solidified and agreed on. And the rest of the other commands like cert, add, cert, remove, or even under sign, there are some other options. There are a bunch of options we'll have to go through and say which ones we want to keep or not. So do, I'm looking for agreement on this. Does, I does that- Actually, I agree with you. I think in practice, the question is, let's say we agree with what you're saying, because what you're saying in what's an RC1 goes to 1.0 makes, makes sense. The, the problem though, what you're suggesting though, is in how we get there. Are we suggesting let's go through each command and finish the specification of what we'll do in RC1, and then we update those command by command, or do we wholeheartedly rip everything out and then optionally put stuff back in? Because the latter sounds much more problematic and as an example, I just did the login one that I was working on just before the meeting um, to kind of have focused uh, PRs on each one. So what I would, to follow that train of thought, what I might suggest is rather than doing a PR that yanks everything out, then we have to optionally put everything back in, is why don't we create issues for each one of the commands and make those tag from RC1 and we have to resolve each command for what we're going to do for RC1. So and do we want to, in, if we do that though, do we need to iterate faster? Because waiting for a week is going to take too long. Oh, I think we always have to iterate faster. But that's, but the question is, is it faster to yank everything out and then try to put things in piece by no. piece? No. I think it's, it's probably easy to, I think by yank, you can even disable some commands. You don't have to take off. It, it depends. It's a, it's a case by case thing. But my criteria for RC1 is enable the basic user experience of signing and verification, which probably means just sign, verify, and login command. That, that's probably the extent of it. And the rest of the commands can be, I mean, we can handle it either way. Um, basically, the commands need to be disabled if you want to move that code into another branch, et cetera, that is a different question. Well, let me, let's take us and pull on this thread for a second. So as we move to the trust store, the current configuration that has the set of keys that we sign and verify with, I'm assuming that winds up getting disabled. So- Yeah, so that's, it's, it's, not, even, it's not even disabled, right? It's, that was the alpha one. Sorry, yeah, it, that was the alpha function. one experience. Yeah, that, that functionality does not work. And like that functionality won't be supported even post RC1, even in GA, because we moved on to trust policy. So everything has to be configured using trust store and trust policy. So, sorry, I'm trying to reply to uh, Chiwei's question. So, um, 
why don't we so so we so we don't wind up yanking everything out or even decapitating each one because I hear what you're saying because I don't think putting a disable on the entry point is really kind of I, I get what you're trying to do, you're forcing the user experience, but the code will still be there. So can we just create issues? We don't have a dozen, we don't have like lots of commands. Can we just create an issue for each one and just note those as RC1 deliverables? And then for instance, when the trust or code gets put, uh, committed, part of the trust or code is to um, take out the config stuff that uses that instead. I would rather take the approach of like the experience first, rather than what's going to be um, um, like the code perspective, right? Um, if you if we're trying to finalize all of these different um, CLI commands for an RC1 release, we essentially have a um, V1 release by the time we're done going through all of the commands and defining how they're going to behave. Um, I think it's faster to kind of just disable commands right now. We don't necessarily need to yak them out from code. Um, we can just not support um, like the CLI commands in, in some places and disabling them is adding code in. We can remove that code once we're agreed on sort of like what the, um, the, the command itself needs to be. It's rewriting. We're going to have to rewrite some of these specs anyway. So we put in a lot of functionality um, that we think is final based on the agreement we have here for v1 um, i would say let's expose that and anything that we haven't agreed upon yet um, we're going to add those things in rc2 rc3 let's take an incremental approach here um, and ensure that you know what we're pushing out in this release candidates are things we're aligned and we can support in v1 so you're suggesting open two issues one that disables the entry point and another one that cleans up the code that's sitting there yeah, and those are those are things that would be tracked for RC2, right? Like for RC1, it should only be like the commands we have agreed on or the, the functionality we have agreed on, right? And and there's a lot that we've agreed upon. Um, and I wouldn't want to kind of put in something that, you know, we still have more work to do on to necessarily get resolved to block all of the work that we've done to date. I think that sounds fun. I'm, I'll move on to the next topic. I think we have we have general agreement here on what the next steps look like. And I think we have consensus on what the RC1 definition of CLI experience look, looks like. I, I think we're close. I don't know if, I, let's, let's do the PR process because I, I think there is. All right, I'll, uh, I'll cover these two PRs. Those are uh, what I wanted to cover go through. Uh, there's one PR I already got some feedback from Shiva on this. This uh, adds the support for the multiple trust stores back and also defines the custom verification level, which I left out in the initial version of trust policy. So uh, this basically, I'm just skimming through this, gave, giving an overview. Uh, Trust stores is an array, like we defined in the version one of this, changed it back to the array. And then here's an example of a custom verification. So these are using the preset or predefined levels. You can say skip or strict, et cetera. But if you wanted to change the definition or do beyond that, uh, you can say signature verification level, specify the level, and then you can override what each of them, each of the individual validations does. So the, this PR is out. Uh, I'm looking for feedback here. And I think other than that, it's mostly, there's detail, there's a whole section on how to set custom verification levels and what can be set or what can be overridden. So for example, uh, expiry, all of these you can enforce log, revocation because it makes an external call you can skip. So I'm looking for feedback here. And so this is one PR, any high level questions on this? Okay, and I got feedback from Shiva, which I addressed. Um, there's one feedback here that I wanted to cover quickly. Um, Shiva, this uh, the CA comma TSA, I think we'll still retain that even if we support an array. 
because you you have like entries like this they they are basically a pair you evaluate signatures using a given ca and a given tsa you can have other entries in the array where you have ca and no tsa which means it's the implied tsa which we currently don't support yet but these these are together because otherwise you don't know in which context that tsa applies Oh, okay. Uh, by the way, uh, is the uh, trust policy uh, human, uh, I mean, added by human or added by program? Currently, it is editable by humans. <laughs> I, I think the end intent is it could be either because we are, we are putting quite some effort on what, what, how it is structured, what terminology, vocabulary we use, etc. But it'll definitely be easier if we support commands that allow you to modify it. So I think the answer is that it's it's both. You can have tools modify it, or it should be at a it should be as readable that a system administrator can modify it. Okay, and thanks. All right, I'll go to the next one. Uh, this is a bit longer. This covers both the verification plugin extensibility. Uh, this was one of the open items. This required like the signature spec and other things to be solidified before I could come and address this spec. And there's a signing scheme spec, which we touched upon when we were in the, in the COSI branch. There's a version of this we touched upon, uh, early version of it. And there was a question around we need to uh, we need to define this concept more properly and how it, what it looks like in signing and verification, et cetera. So there's a whole doc just on signing scheme. And at a very high level, what it does is it defines two models of signing workflows, or default X509, which is CA and end entity and certificates issued to end entity and a signing authority, which allows a signing service or a signing authority, which both uh, an end user and a verifying entity trust. And there is details around what, how that is used during signature creation and how it is used in signature verification. So this will require some, th this will require review. This is, this is totally new material. And then same for the verification plugin. In the plugin extensibility, there is previously we had the signature generator and envelope generator. They are slightly renamed. Now we have two verification capabilities. Uh, it's not limited to these capabilities. We can add more, but th these are some of the common ones that that we'll use or uh, we'll build a plugin on. So there's a whole uh, let's see. There's a whole section on verification extensibility, uh, the algorithm for it, and a new command, verify signature. And all of this is um, signature format agnostic. So if we have JWS or COSI, all of that works through the same interface, same, same principle that we use for the uh, signing plugin uh, as well. So you have a verify signature request, which populates aspects of the signature that a plugin can uh, kind of do custom validation on. And it is kind of tightly defined where the plugin tells, sorry, notation tells the plugin which set of uh, validations it wants the plugin to do. There's also a aspect of uh, what critical attributes notation processed. And if there are custom critical attributes that notation doesn't know about, then this gets populated. And then the plugin responds back saying for each of the verification, what is the result? Or each of the validation, what is the result? And then any of the critical attributes that notation didn't know about, but the plugin knows about, it can process and send back all the results. Um, yeah, so these two PRs, 
this one is in draft. I will finalize it by tonight. And I'm going to ping Shiva Roy at a minimum to give feedback there. On the first one, I already got feedback from Shiva. Uh, but uh, Steve, you're also free to look at this PR. I'll tag you on this PR. All right, that that was kind of covering the PR updates. Any any questions on the, either of these PRs? All right, thanks. Was that the last topic in the list? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I moved a bunch of things to next week. Um, I do, I would like Samir, uh, if you and I can set a time before Thursday to sync up because there's a lot of project related things to do. Um, and I also know that for, you know, there's a lot of, you know, per the items that are on, there's a lot of things to triage that are on the backlog. Um, so if people asynchronously want to go to the items that are on the list that are alpha one, alpha two and RC, um, from now till then, that would be great um, because that would help us to move things forward to close out on RC1. Cool. I think in, the, in terms of uh, implementation PRs, uh, there are PRs from Rakesh and Pritesh that are in review. I also saw a PR for directory spec. Uh, Shiva, are there any other PRs we should expect this week? Any related to registry authentication or registry interaction? Uh, nope. So uh, we are working on the ORAS Go uh, Article 1. So uh, once it's released, uh, we will uh, update the uh, dependency for the uh, notation Go. Okay. So and then we will, yeah. So other than the directory spec, um, I just want to cover this quickly because you're not available on Thursday. Uh, we had the registry auth. So the registry auth, I think we were planning on PR being, or at least the kind of the end date we were tracking was 7-11 for all of the PRs that included the directory spec, registry auth, and any registry refactoring. So the directory spec, I, I saw initial PR. I don't know how, how much of it is the final version. Um, do you think the registry authentication PR will get done by 7-Eleven? 7-Eleven. Um... Basically going by, the, going by the projected dates we had in the spreadsheet. Yeah, should be good. Okay, sounds good. And um, we we all will also we have a lot of functionality being built up around signing and verification uh, and the registry directory etc. Uh, we we'll look at uh, alpha release for the all of these updates. I think most of the user experience right now uh, reflects our alpha one initial experience. Once the, all of the trust store changes are in, we'll, we'll cut a new alpha release for that. Just giving a heads up. All right, that covers everything from my side. Thanks. Uh, David, I will look over the changes before our Thursday meeting. I'm not sure if I can carve out spare time between now and Thursday morning meeting, but if I do, I'll, I'll ping you. Otherwise, we'll cover as much on Thursday and then set up some time after that. Okay, great. Well, thanks, folks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.